Chapter 13. The Hopes of the Crowd. Madison Square Garden Bowl, Long Island City. New York, June 13, 1935. As Jim Braddock stepped out into the bright lights, the crowd became silent. The ring seemed so far away. Between him and it were thousands of people Jim's people. He knew the looks on their faces people who saw no chance of a future. Some had spent their last dollar to be here. But tonight they all held their heads high. Their eyes followed him with the wild hope that the story of the Cinderella man would have a happy ending. It was the strangest walk to the ring. Jim had ever made. As he passed, people got to their feet. They smiled and nodded and waved at their hero. But they were still silent. Finally, someone called his name and the shout broke the silence for everybody. The whole crowd 35,000 people began to shout, and the noise went up to the star-filled sky. May's sister Alice was looking for Jay. Howard, and Rosie, to call them to supper. There was no sign of the children. Were they hiding? She was going to look outside, when she heard a sound from the closet under the stairs. All three children were sitting around a radio. They looked up at their aunt. And Alice knew that she couldn't stop them. Without saying a word, she sat down next to the children and listened to the announcer on the radio. I don't know if you can hear me, the announcer was shouting. I can't hear myself. The crowd is on its feet and the noise is deafening. Back in the Madison Square Garden Bowl. The crowd was silent again when they realized that. Max Bear was walking to the ring. The champion felt the crowd's fear. He enjoyed it. When he had climbed into the ring, Bear ran around and accepted the crowd's booze with a confident smile on his face. The referee called the boxers. And their corner men to him. I want a clean fight, he said. When I say break, step back immediately. And remember he looked at Jim protect yourself at all times. As the fighters touched gloves. Bear's corner man held a gold watch in front of Braddock's face. One minute to midnight, Cinderella. He laughed. The fighters returned to their corners. Bear's manager, Ansel Hoffman, whispered final words of advice to the champion. But Bear wasn't interested. Jim closed his eyes. Finally, the sound of the bell broke the silence and the fight began. Round 1. Braddock came out fast and hard, hoping to surprise the champion. Showing no fear, he hit Bear with a right hand. And then followed it with a left to the body. The champion tried to punch back. But Braddock danced away. On Braddock's next attack, Bear was ready. His left fist hit Braddock's ribs hard. Braddock's answer was a combination of punches a long right to the face. Another right, a left. And a final right to the chin. The champion knew now that Braddock had a good punch. But he refused to show any pain. Calm down, old man, Bear laughed as the fighters held on to each other. I'll let the fight go a few rounds. As the bell rang, Bear knew that he had lost the round on points. But he didn't care. He was confident that he could end this fight at any time with one punch. In the corner, Gould met Braddock with a big smile. Did you see the look on Bear's face when you hit him? Jim took out his mouth guard. Yes, he was laughing. So use your left hand to knock that smile off his face. In the opposite corner, Ansel Hoffman was shouting, but Bear waved him away. I'll kill him when I'm ready. You're left, Jimmy, Joe said again. Remember your left. Round 2. Braddock came out with his fists moving at the start of the second round, too. Nobody expected this fight to go one round, the radio announcer was saying. But it's only reached round 2 because Bear is playing with Braddock. He's thrown almost no punches and he's laughing at the challenger. But soon Bear started throwing more punches, aiming at Braddock's weak ribs. The strength of Bear's punches knocked the breath out of him. The champion has really hurt the challenger, said the announcer. The crowd began to boo. That's the right place, isn't it, old man? said Bear. The referee separated the fighters at the sound of the bell. One of Braddock's corner men worked on the fighters' cuts, while the other gave the boxer water. Jim coughed it back up. He needed air, not water. Joe examined Jim's ribs. They're not broken, he said. Not yet. Across the ring, Bear was playing and acting for the cameras. As he watched this, Jim realized that he himself didn't care about pleasing the crowd now. He wasn't even fighting Bear. He was fighting to beat the thing that had beaten him. He was fighting for his family's future. Round 3. For the third time, Braddock came out fast. He threw his punches at Bear's head. But the champion's punches were aimed at his opponent's body. 
Bear continued to hit Braddock's ribs hard with both hands. He hit Braddock with a low punch, and the referee warned the champion to keep his fists up. Before the fight started again, Gould saw that Braddock's gloves were down by his side, but there was no time to shout a warning. Bear had seen it, too. He hit the side of Braddock's head with a big left-hand punch. Jim's legs bent. He was clearly in terrible pain was he going to fall? Gould froze in fear. He thought about giving in, ending the fight. Give him a chance, Joe, said the corner man. A few seconds later, Jim stood straighter and reached for the ropes. Bear couldn't believe it. He attacked again, but this time Braddock hit back with a long right, then a left jab that made Bear's head look like a punching bag. That's it. Shouted Gould, jumping up and down. Round 4. From the start of the next round, both men stood toe-to-toe, -to -toe, throwing jabs. Braddock's feet were quicker and his punches more effective. So Bear started aiming for the body again. After a few good punches to the ribs, he was sure that every breath caused Braddock terrible pain. The two men held each other again and the referee called for them to break. But Bear continued to hold Braddock. Dirty fighting. Shouted Gould angrily from the corner. I warned you, the referee told Bear. When I say break. You break. The crowd booed as Bear finally stepped back. He shook the sweat from his thick black hair and held up his hands to apologize. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see that Braddock wasn't protecting himself. Without warning, Bear turned and delivered an enormous punch to Braddock's ribs. To everybody's surprise especially Bear's Braddock replied with a combination of left-right punches before stepping back. Round 5. Bear's manager. Ansel Hoffman, couldn't understand it. The challenger's ribs were in bad condition. But Braddock was still controlling the fight, jabbing Bear again and again and tiring him. The timing of the champion's punches wasn't right, and Hoffman knew that he was waiting for the chance to deliver his big knockout punch instead of tiring his opponent. But Bear wasn't able to hit Braddock, who dodged and danced away skillfully. The champion was getting angry now. He hit Braddock with an illegal backhand punch as the referee separated the two fighters. The referee warned Bear. But the two men continued fighting before holding on to each other again. Step back! shouted the referee. But the two men didn't let go. Braddock hit the champion's chin with his head. The champion shouted in anger. He lifted Braddock and threw him into the ropes, paying no attention to the boos of the crowd. When the round was over, Hoffman shouted angrily at Bear, What are you doing? Relax, the champion told him. I'll relax, replied Ansel, when we walk out of here with the title. Round 6. Bear hit Braddock with three good punches in the first seconds of the round. Blood poured from the challenger's nose and mouth. But then, suddenly, it seemed to Bear that a train had hit him. It was Braddock's right hand. And it hit the champion on the chin with enormous power. Bear stepped back, fighting for air. But Braddock gave him no space, throwing punch after punch with his left hand. One of them hit the champion just above the eye. Bear fought back, but his aim wasn't as good as the challenger's. His right eye began to close. For the first time in this fight, Bear felt relief when the bell rang. He promised himself that he would end the fight in the next round, even if he had to kill the Cinderella man to do it. Round 7. As soon as the round began, it was clear that Bear had a new attitude. Joe Gould could see it. The crowd could also feel the change. Bear wanted to finish this fight now. But Braddock wasn't afraid. He met the champion in the middle of the ring and the two fighters continued the fight. Bear hit Braddock with several punches to the body. The last of these hit below the belt. Keep your punches up, Max, said Braddock. Bear smiled and delivered a combination of punches to his opponent's body and head. Is that up enough? Braddock forced himself to smile through the pain. That's fine, Max. As the bell rang, Bear continued throwing punches. Braddock hit back as hard as he could. But Max Bear just laughed. I can't believe this. Said the radio announcer. Everybody expected the champion to win easily. But now, after the seventh round, neither fighter is ahead. Either of them could win. Chapter 14. The Luckiest Man. Alice? The house seemed empty. May looked at the uneaten meal on her sister's kitchen table. Then she heard noises from the closet in the hall. They were all their May's three children and her sister listening to the fight on the radio. The crowd was expecting big things from champion Max Bear in the eighth round, the radio announcer was saying. 
but Jim Braddock refused to be beaten. Rosie looked up and saw her mother. It's the police, she said to the others. By the ninth round, it was a fact that Braddock had fought better than anybody expected, continued the announcer. But some people were saying that Bear allowed this to happen. In the tenth round, the champion was in complete control of the fight. May reached to turn off the radio. Jay's eyes met hers. Please, Mom. She looked into their hopeful faces and knew that she couldn't say no. But she refused to listen herself. Without a word, she turned and walked away, as the eleventh round began. Round 11. Bear was mad as he rushed out. He chased Braddock around the ring, throwing punches at the challenger. And then it came Bear's big punch, the one that had killed two men. When it hit him, Braddock's mind was in a fog. He felt heavy and light at the same time. And his legs could only just support him. He felt the ropes on his back. Suddenly, a memory of his family came into Jim's head his wife and children. The reason why he was here. He let the rope support him for a few seconds, and then he pushed forward, back on his feet. Bear just stared at Braddock, unable to believe that the challenger had taken the punch and not been knocked out. Jim looked back into Bear's broken face and smiled. For the rest of the round, Bear tried to finish his opponent. But his wild punches missed. Braddock hit back with a jab, a cross, another jab. With each punch, he felt his strength returning. There was blood on Bear's face now. At the end of the round, Braddock's corner men worked urgently on the cut under the fighter's eye. Joe Gould seemed close to tears. Jimmy, said his manager. Win, or lose. Thanks, Joe, for all of it. Jim lifted a bloody glove. Now stop talking. Round 12. Bear started the 12th round still trying to finish the fight with one big punch. But the challenger was faster and dodged the punches. He's slow. Shouted Gould from the corner. The crowd was shouting in both happiness and fear. You're right, it is a funeral, shouted the young reporter next to Sporty Lewis. Max Bear's funeral. But Lewis didn't hear. He was on his feet, shouting like everybody else. The crowd's shout was like a wave of noise. Braddock! 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 It was too much for Max Bear. He ran at Braddock, moving his fists fast and hard. The punches hit the challenger, the last one below the belt. Braddock bent over in pain as the round ended. Joe Gould jumped over the ropes, shouting angrily at Bear. The referee and the fight's doctor had to lift the little manager back out of the ring. Bear just stood in the center of the ring. That low punch lost you the round, the referee told him. Bear waved him away and moved back to his corner. Ansel Hoffman was waiting for him. You're losing. Are you listening to me? Do you want to lose the title to this nobody? At her sister's house in New Jersey. May had stopped pretending to herself that she was reading the newspaper that she wasn't listening to the radio. She went back to the hall, where the others still sat listening. May hid around the corner so her children couldn't see her. She stood in the dark and listened to the 13th and 14th rounds with growing fear. At last, when there was just one more round in the fight, she stepped out of the shadows. Rosie moved to the side. Sit here, mommy. May joined her children. Pale with worry, she listened to the announcer. It's the fifteenth and final round. The crowd is shouting at Braddock to stay away because Bear is looking for the knockout. But Braddock is not staying away, and Bear is delivering the biggest punches of his life. May saw the fear now in her children's eyes. Would their father come home tonight? But Braddock is not only standing. He's coming forward. Round 15. In the ring. Max Bear and Jim Braddock were beaten, bloody and tired. They fought for air as they circled each other, looking for a chance to get past their opponent's defenses. Bear's fists flew and all of his punches were strong enough to knock a man out. But they were wild and anxious. Braddock remained on his feet. He kept coming forward, bringing the fight to Bear. The final seconds of the fight seemed to stretch forever. For the boxers, the crowd seemed to disappear, the referee, the judges, and the managers were gone, too. For each man there was only the other fighter. Braddock danced to the side and threw a jab. Bear saw his chance. He threw his famous right punch and hit Braddock right in the head. It knocked the challenger to the side, and now Bear could hit him with the second punch. Silence fell over the crowd. Was this the end? No. Braddock turned and just managed to dodge the next punch. He hit back, and the two men were still throwing punches when the final bell rang. The fight had ended. Everybody waited to hear the fight officials announce a winner. 
It was clear which fighter the crowd wanted. Braddock! 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 Minutes later, Braddock was still resting on the ropes while the fight doctor examined him and Joe Gould took his boxing gloves off. I don't like it, said Joe. The judges are taking too long. A shadow fell across their corner. It was Max Bear, who looked. Jim Braddock in the eye. You beat me. It doesn't matter what they say. Jim tried to find the right words. But Bear was gone before he had a chance to say them. At last. The judges handed a small, white card to the fight announcer. He climbed over the ropes and moved to the microphone in the middle of the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner. A new heavyweight champion of the world. The rest of his words were lost in an explosion of noise. The same noise filled the streets of Newark. People poured from their houses into the streets to celebrate. They poured out of Father Rorick's church to join everybody else in an unplanned street party. People laughed and cried with happiness. Faces that looked old with worry became suddenly young again. At her sister's house, May's cry cut the night. As the family celebrated, little Rosie smiled proudly at her mother. It's the steak, she said. Back at the Madison Square Garden Bowl, the crowd pushed forward for a better look at the Cinderella man. Everybody wanted to shake his hand, to touch him, to take home a little of his magic for themselves. James J. Braddock stood in the center of the ring. With his arms lifted over his head. Tears poured from his eyes. He listened to the crowd's shouts. But his heart was in another place. It was in a little New Jersey apartment, where his wife and three children would soon be waiting for him to come home. In the end, they were the reason why he was not only the heavyweight champion of the world, but also the luckiest man in it. And so James J. Braddock, at the age of 29, became the heavyweight champion of the world on June 13, 1935. None of the judges disagreed with the decision. For the public and the press, his win was one of the biggest surprises in the history of the sport. Most agreed that Bear had been beaten by a better boxer on the night. For two years, Braddock didn't box again. Finally, a fight was arranged with Joe Louis, the Brown Bomber from Detroit. On June 22, 1937, the two fighters met in Chicago. By this time, Braddock was not as strong or healthy as he had been. His left arm was very weak. But he still managed to knock Louis down in the first round. By the fourth round, Joe Louis was controlling the fight. According to Braddock, after a couple of rounds, I knew I was in there with a great fighter. The end came when Louis knocked Braddock out in the eighth round. When he hit me with that right, I just lay there. Joe Louis later became one of the greatest heavyweight title holders in the history of boxing. James J. Braddock fought one more fight after that. In 1938, against a young boxer from Wales, Tommy Farr. Farr had lasted all 15 rounds against Louis, and most people expected him to beat Braddock. Again, Braddock surprised everybody by winning the fight. Then he decided to leave the sport as a winner. I have won my last fight, he announced to the press. After he stopped boxing, Jim Braddock remained friends with Joe Gould. And Braddock had a lot to thank his manager for. When Gould had allowed Joe Louis to challenge Braddock for the title in 1937, he had demanded money from all Joe Louis's heavyweight title fights for the next 10 years if Louis won. Jim and May. Braddock were never poor again. The couple lived in the same New Jersey house that they bought after Jim won the heavyweight title. Jim spent the rest of his life surrounded by friends and neighbors who admired and loved him. Looking back, Jim Braddock said that, when Bear hit him with his best punch and Jim didn't fall, he was the happiest guy in the world. The story of the Cinderella man did have a happy ending.